Hey guys, welcome back. Another video where we're just kind of talking fishing with a random person on the internet. Um, tonight I talked to a YouTube subscriber. Um, he's somewhat local. What's really neat about Daniel is he paints his own lures. And so I talk a little bit about that with him. And we talk a little bit about fishing the Tennessee River. Um, he fishes specifically around Kentucky Lake. And so if you fish in that area or interested in learning about that area, stay tuned as I talk to Daniel about the custom painting lure process and his approach to fishing Kentucky Lake. All right, we're live and recording. What's up, man? Daniel, just a recent up, YouTube uh, subscriber or actually just found one of my videos through YouTube and uh, have been watching a video or two. Oh, yeah, probably watched. I don't know, pretty much every video you put on there. Oh man, well I appreciate it. I'm sure that's helping the, the YouTube uh, algorithms and maybe it's recommending it to uh, some other folks. Uh, since you're new to the channel, uh, I know some of the guys that are watching probably don't know you, but I think you're somewhat local, right? Just west of Nashville? Yes, sir. Cool, and I think what's neat uh, what's neat about you is I th you were, we were talking a little bit about custom painted lures, and so you uh, do a little bit of that on the side. You wanna talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I um, just kind of a hobby of my own. You know, it's like something that I got into just um, pass the time in the winter time. Yeah. So this is this is my setup here. All my paint that I use. Here's some that I've painted already. So I got some jerk baits, glide baits, square bills. So what'd you say that I know you got a few different lures there. What was the what's the coolest one, or what's one that you're the are the most proud of right now i don't know it's kind of that one's kind of hard for me to probably this right here this is this took me a minute yeah a little square bill yeah but there, there's a lot going on in this paint job here nice and i call it my war bug now do you change out the hooks at all or do you keep the hooks uh the same or yeah, you... they don't come with hooks so i i buy a bunch of different hooks like some wide gaps um, I got all kind of, I got the Gamagatsu, uh, and then sometimes, you know, like I'll, I'll buy like a bunch of lures that are on sale that I don't like the colors Yeah. and then I'll strip them down and repaint them. Um, I got all, all kinds of like different eyes, the, uh, like natural fire, all that good stuff. Like pretty much anything and everything that I, I need to you know, if I want a particular color, uh, change it up and, you know, make it happen. Nice. Now, um, I saw you have a few different set of eyes there. How do you decide which ones to use? It just kind of depends on the size of the bait or what you're looking well, for. Well, I try to, I try to use like a color that kind of goes with the bait. So like yeah. this is that, focus. the, it's kind of in a red. Yeah. So I use like the red and the eyes, gotcha. make it look as natural as possible. Cool. You know, this is like got some green in it, so I threw my green eyes. Yeah. Try to keep them natural. Like this has some orange accents in it. Has some orange accents in the eyes. So I feel like you gotta have like some good heavy duty soup glue, right, for all that stuff to kind of stay on there. Yeah, I uh, I just use like Loctite the stuff. Gotcha. And then you have like a little painting booth there. It looks like maybe to the right of that. Yeah, this is my. It's got like a uh, like a ventilation that I can like direct it out the door if I want. Yeah. Like if I'm in some uh, some stinky different paints and stuff, I can just push it right out so that way the woman doesn't gripe at me. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Man, that's a cool little shop uh, you got there, and I bet you that comes in handy, especially uh, this time of year where it's like dark and cold and you don't have anything else to do. You can just kind of hang out in the garage and mess around with this stuff. Yeah. At some point, I can I can paint like live for you and show you what I do, and like you can pick a pattern or something like that, and just give me a challenge, and I'll see if I can make it come to life. Cool. I, I don't know if uh, it looks like you you had the you have the whole uh, phone set up on something that um that square bill that you got. Do you feel like that's like a good lure around this time of year, like to throw in in shallow pockets and coves and whatnot as the I hear the fall time, you know, the, the bass are supposed to go shallow and, or, and chase bait fish. Or do you feel like that's more well, of a springtime pattern? Uh, for me, I fish a lot 
like pretty much year round, I'm always fishing deep. Yeah. So, like I got the square bills to kind of just have, like kind of force myself to use them, uh, you know, because I'm painting them, you know, and I, I look at it and I'm like, oh, that looks, that looks awesome. I yeah. want to throw that. So like this one right here, like if I was going to like a lake or something like that where I knew they were kind of feeding on some bluegill, that's why I painted that. Yeah. Like a red belly. I thought this would be great, real shallow. Uh, some of those places that have like creeks coming in, I thought that would that would work. I don't know. It was just my thought process. But I'm not yeah, gonna... and it sounds like that one has a, a rattle. You use there sometimes where you use a rattle and you you don't, or or maybe that's the hook that I heard so I heard. Yeah, it does. It have a rattle. On. Gotcha. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that the rattles in stained water can help. Yeah, that's what I heard. Like when you know when you don't have. Uh, as great of a visibility, then uh, rattles help. But if it's like clear, you know, bluebird skies and the water's clear, and you got good visibility. I heard you want a little bit more of a silent bait. So didn't know if you found that true with you or when you're fishing. Yeah, I mean, I just kind of go out and experiment and see if I can make something happen. Like yeah. I'm not the the most experienced, you know, fisherman out there. So I just kind of, you know, I'll watch some YouTube videos, like you know how I found you. Yeah, and I'll look at what you do and then I'll try to incorporate that into my fishing whenever I go out I'll be like well you know he was saying that you yeah. know he's fishing shallow with some square bills you know trying to bounce it off some wood or something like that and see if it can trigger a reaction strike all right I'm gonna go out and try that today and you know yeah. so I just I kind of develop as I go and you know just use as many different techniques as I can and yeah. try to uh, for me my my comfort has always been, you know, just slow fishing, dragging the bottom, whether it be a jig, a worm, you know, and I, I've caught my personal best fish on a, um, like a little 10 inch worm. Yeah. So, you know, just dragging the bottom has always been effective for me. So is uh, you more of a Texas rig guy or like a Carolina rig? Texas rig. Yeah. A little bit. Is it, for you, is it like easier to cast and just like less things that like, tie up and all the good stuff. I, I feel like sometimes a Carolina rig can get a little awkward, you know, do you have that leader line? I think the reason that I end up going with that more often is because I don't really have to worry about getting snagged up. Yeah. You know, I can just throw it into whatever, don't have to worry about it getting snagged up. And, you know, I've got that, um, I can control, you know, like, I can feel it better. If that gotcha. Makes sense. You know, uh, one of the things I was chatting with you about is I think you fish out at Tennessee River. I'm going to try to do a screen share here, and I got some stuff uh, queued up for us. You should be looking at a web browser, maybe on, my maybe Onyx. You see that? I see it. Cool. So I think this is the uh, the New Johnsonville um, boat yep. ramp. You probably kind of launch out of this area and whatnot. So hopefully this looks familiar. Let me see if I can uh, – crap, I can't find my zoom button. Right, let me move us down there. I'm gonna zoom in. You know, I, I recently went down to Gunnersville and fished. Uh, you know, it's Tennessee River down there, and I'm trying to find like an example of one of the things that we did. Oh, no. Yeah, man, it's a lot different with that grass. <laughs> yeah, I wish. Oh, I wish the grass would come back. Yeah. So, like, I don't know if you can kind of see here. I don't know if you're familiar with this little pocket here. But one of the things that we did when we were fishing that Tennessee River is we would kind of post up on this point, and I don't know how the current flows, whether it's this way or, or that way, but we would basically go up current, throw like a Carolina rig, and just like slowly drift down, and like just bounce the lure off rocks on a Carolina rig. And we were using uh, like a three quarter ounce um, or half ounce weight in that, um, in that lead, and that roundness, and like it would just bounce off the rocks. And I was really like, really super surprised that it would never get hung up because i was like you you know if you're like throwing around these rocks and boaters and carolina rig it just seems like to get hung up but again we would throw it up current and just let that current work its way down and a lot of times that's when we would get the bites is as the as that bait was working towards us because that bait's coming down current you know it just looks a lot more natural and that fish is you know positioned up current and it's just waiting for that lure to come by fish in the tennessee river for me they are current driven yeah if not pulling current it is almost impossible to get them to bite 
Um, when you notice that they're feeding, are you still kind of dragging that lure around? Or are you getting you picking up a crankbait? Um, I always like a reaction strike. Yeah. Uh, like something moving. You know, if it, if I feel like the bite's really good. I want a crankbait bite for sure. Yeah. I, it also depends on the time of year. Um, probably this time of year, I'm gonna be throwing like a blade bait. Yeah. Uh, would that be like a, a chatter bait or? Um, like a lipless, uh, something that vibrates when I can rip it up and up, up and down. Yeah. Um, I really like that yo-yoing. Yeah. And I've gotten some really, really big bites there. Yeah. From a bladed bait, are you a, like a, the expensive, like, um, chatter bait? Like, uh, there's like, I feel like they have like a $15, $15 chatter bait and they have like an $8 chatter bait. I didn't know. I actually if I... have all of mine custom made. Oh, wow. Really? I have a friend of mine that makes them, and I pick out the colors that I want, and he builds them. Nice. Well, one of the things that I've noticed is, like, I'm trying to use different chatter baits. I feel like sometimes there can be some inconsistency. You know, you'll throw it out there, and you pull it up and kind of rip on a little bit, and you're waiting for that blade to kind of go back and forth. Do you feel like that one that you use is pretty consistent? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, feel, I feel like the ones that my buddy makes, they – they have a real they're not real violent oh yeah the, the streaks are a little bit more subtle so i can just kind of watch my rod tip just kind of ever so slightly gotcha. and so i think right now that that is just like that's what i want i don't want it really like you know that blade going crazy yeah on mine like the, a lot of those z-man chatter baits i can just feel it just going do, 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 you know and that's when it's cool when you get a bite because that thing stops and if something feels weird and you just kind of lean into it and uh you know most a lot of times there's a fish on there, so that's always kind of cool, you know? Yeah. Ain't nothing better than that load up. Yeah. Uh, what about rods and reels? I know we talked a little bit about crankbaits and square bills uh, earlier. Do you have, like, a dedicated, like, crankbait rod that's a little bit more parabolic and certain lines you use or anything? Uh, I mean, I always – I like a medium heavy for pretty much – I use it on a lot of different things. Yeah, no, that's uh, a good starting point. I feel like good all around. But yeah. I've got, I've got all kinds of rods. <laughs> yeah, just like that. With anything else, I did make a mistake. Actually, it's funny that you mentioned that. Um, you know about rods and selection of things, like what you're doing with the rod. The last time that I was out at your lake, um, I, I was fishing hard all day in the wind. Nothing was happening, and then the one bite that I did get was on that bladed jig. And I missed the bite because the rod that I was using had too much flex in it. It was just flimsy, and I should have been throwing it on like a medium heavy. Instead, I was like, it was a, like a medium fast. Yeah. And it also had mono on it, which had even more. Stretch. I just don't even know why, what I was thinking, why I was doing, you know, I was just kind of tied it on real quick, threw it out, and, and then I got the bite with it, and whenever I went to set the hook on it, it was just like a noodle. So yeah. Can't penetrate that hook. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I like enjoy like making uh, like these type of videos and hoping to talk to other people and maybe um, other folks are watching, but I feel like that's important, right? Like, so when you're uh, especially like, you know, you're talking about like using too soft of a rod. And so basically you had a soft rod and using mono, which stretches, you know? So when you go set that hook, you can't get that hook penetration. Whereas if you you know if you had like a medium heavy that's fast and maybe throwing on fluorocarbon or um, you know braided line you'd be able to get that hook penetration probably bring, be able to bring that fish in, but I feel like you know you if you if you're using that rod on like a crankbait and you're using braided line and it's like treble hooks I feel like a lot of times like that rod is so sensitive in that braid line when that fish like bites on it and when you yank on it like it's easy to pull that out of its mouth you know, yeah so. So I think all yeah, that you, stuff's uh, important. I like a softer rod for my crankbaits. Yeah. Uh, I like to have that, you know, parabolic bend. Yeah. Uh, you know, I want it to have that backbone whenever I go to set the hook, but I also want the tip to kind of give me a little bit of forgiveness. So yeah. that way I'm not like, oh, there's a bite and just yank it right out, you know? Yeah. Are you typically throwing on a floral or mono, or you try to change it up based on the depth that you're fishing? or? I love braided line. Oh, really? Like, I, almost everything I throw has braid on it. I try to, um, you know, like things that I need to get them down further. 
I'm going to try to use like mono and stuff like that yeah. uh, to try to so the line doesn't float and end up keeping my lure from going down to its depth that it needs to be at. Yeah. Now you like the braid just because like from easy casting perspective from a bait caster and you don't have to change out the line as much and doesn't get nicked. And... I feel like I don't get uh, many birds nest whenever I'm using yeah. the braid. Yeah, and it's easier to like, pick out. Yeah, that mono and stuff, it gets a little bit of memory to it. Yeah. And then once it gets that, you know, you go to cast and it's, you know, yeah. explodes everywhere and you're like fiddling with it forever. So, and then I think with uh, like that type of line, you have to change it out a lot more often. Uh, where braid, I just kind of like load it up. And as long as it ain't frayed, then I keep fishing it. Yeah. So this is a, a good tip that uh, I like to talk to people about and they're still watching that you know this is a good thing for you all to do if you're not doing it but if you want to use fluorocarbon it's you know obviously it's a little bit more expensive than um than mono like what i do is I, i'll just back spool it with braid and so i'll i'll put you know 50 percent braid on it and in the other half i'll put floral you know as long yep. as i'm not getting that to the end of the braid that way i can you know i like that fluorocarbon for me like it gets down a little bit more and it has a little bit of stretch and so that's why i like it versus just straight braid um, so I can save some money by not filling up the whole line. Was that the double you need to put it together? Yeah, and like when when I'm putting it together, like it's so like deep in the spool, like it, it doesn't get to that point. Like I'm just using that braid as a filler line. But man, I've uh, enjoyed chatting with you, man. I appreciate you uh, kind of talking me through uh, your setup there, and uh, I'll touch base with you uh, here a little bit. Let you get some dinner, and we can figure out a game plan for this weekend. Sounds good, man. All Have right, a good bro. Night. Talk to you. See you.